Hi, good. thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Fabrice Bois. I'm one of the founders of Async, and we are one of the companies building the Lightning Network, so we, we work on the specifications of Lightning. Uh, we implement Lightning, and we also run one of the biggest nodes of mainnet, probably the biggest node. We've been doing that for four years, and we are actually the second Lightning implementation. The first one was Blockstream. Uh, Blockstream stream score lightning, second one with us, and then lightning knives LA. So I'm going to, to dive into lightning, explain uh, how it works, what it's based on, what works very well, what doesn't work as well, what are the operational, operational issues we will see in our node, and how some of it could be improved. So the first part is going to be a 90 minutes. Um, I try to uh, have poses and make you ask as many questions as needed. The idea is that you really get what are the foundations of Lightning from a technical point of view and uh, how we use Bitcoin and Lightning and, and not get left behind, not, not let anyone be left behind. So I'm going to start with the building blocks, uh, how Bitcoin works and what are the properties of Bitcoin that we use in Lightning. So the, the three very important uh, things you have to understand about Bitcoin from a technical point of view are the blockchain, the UTXO, and the script. So who doesn't know what UTXO means? Everyone, okay. I don't know any of this. Everyone knows what UTXO means. Okay, who doesn't know how the scripting language in Bitcoin works? Okay, so the, the, the most important thing is UTXO. The, the blockchain, that's very easy. Uh, it's a peer-to-peer -peer network. Um, transactions are grouped into blocks. Blocks are chains together, and there's a global consensus, which means all nodes, all big nodes, have to agree on the, the exact same blockchain. It's a very hard problem. It's so hard that before Bitcoin White Paper was published, people thought it was impossible to solve in a, in a useful, practical way. So this I'm going to skip on this very quickly. Uh, I'm going to skip on the blockchain because this one is really easy. UTXO, I spend more time on this because UTXO is, in my opinion, the most important thing to learn about Bitcoin. If you, it's, it's not intuitive, like it's not something you find in, in many, many other um, uh, areas, and if you don't get it, you won't get lightning. And the scripts, it's not as important, but uh, it's still it's useful to explain that you have smart contracts in Bitcoin, they are very limited, but you can do more than just send to a public key or check a signature. So the blockchain, basically all these rules are made to uh, be sure that you only spend money that you own, that you control with the private key. The blockchain is very easy. If, if I'm too slow or too quick, just tell me, but, and if you have questions, just raise your hand. You have blocks, headers that include uh, the hash of the previous block, like a linked list, uh, the hash of transactions in the block, and a proof of work. And a proof of work is very simple. The hash of a block has to be below a given target. Uh, mining is basically very simple. You iterate over the nonce until you find a header whose hash is below your given target. The first transaction in the, in the block is a coin-based transaction, that's how you create Bitcoin. And the reward that you get when you find a new block is divided by two new formulas. Um, it's very, it works because you actually have to use something, so you can't mine on two different blocks at the same time. This is not a property you get that easily with proof of stake, which is why some people are, um, one of the main criticisms of getting proof of stake is, is uh, nothing at stake. But Bitcoin, you have to use something. You have to use resources to mine a block. And the best chain is the chain with the most work. Uh, people say it's the longest chain. It is not the longest chain. It's the chain with the most accurate proof of work. But in practice, it is the longest chain. It's just, in theory, it's possible it would be two different chains. So, uh, uh, <laughs> it works. One of the good things about proof of work is it actually works. It's very easy to understand. It's very easy to understand how security is. It is extremely hard to reason about proof of stake from a security point of view. What are the attack vectors? How safe is it? 
proof of work. Uh, it's again very easy to explain and it just works. And it's very easy, easy to verify. So this is an actual block. I don't know if you've seen uh, blocks before, but you can see that the hash looks really strange. It starts with a lot of zeros. It's not supposed to have hashes. are supposed to be uniform functions. So it, this is supposed to be random. It's not, because that hash has to be below a given target. This is the Merkle roots of all the transactions in the block. And this is the hash of the previous block in the network. So when you receive a new block, you check that you can attach it to, to the latest block that you have, you check the proof of work, and you check the transactions in the block. And that's how you can say that the block is done. And this is very quick. One of the good things about proof of work is it is very expensive to compute new blocks. It's very cheap to check that hash is below a given target. It takes about microseconds. Mm -hmm. UTXO, th th that's the hard stuff. So again, who doesn't know what UTXO means? Okay. So Bitcoin has a very strange model. Um, most systems work with accounts, fixed accounts. So you send to a fixed account, you get money out of a fixed account. Bitcoin is very different. Um, the key is transaction, unspent transaction outputs, UTXO. Uh, transaction in Bitcoin spends the outputs of other transactions and create new outputs. So a Bitcoin transaction is basically a list of inputs and a list of outputs. And the rule is the inputs are basically an ID and an index. So it means I am spending that uh, specific um, transaction output, a signature script, which means you prove that you can actually spend that input, and the outputs are just an amount and a public key script. So you say how much you want in that output, and you set the conditions for spending that output. So these are, this is how Bitcoin works. So basically, when you find a Bitcoin transaction on Explorer, you can just follow back all the inputs to several con-based transactions, transactions that create money uh, with new blocks. What this means is the UTXO set changes with every block. So the, one of the main um, duties of a Bitcoin node is to manage the UTXO set and update it every time a new block comes in. You check that all the inputs in your new block are actually in the UTX sets, and you replace them with the new outputs created by the transactions in that block. If an input is not in the UTX set, that transaction is not valid, and so that block is not valid. So again, the, the UTX sets can be thought of as the state of your Bitcoin node that changes every time you apply a new block. And um, it's, I don't know how many billions you take servers we have today, I think it's a few millions. Uh, but it's one of the constraints for Bitcoin is it has to be indexed and available very quickly. So uh, it has to be basically memory, otherwise it takes more time to validate the transactions. And this is one of the biggest, um, most, uh, I would say, useful data that is kept by Bitcoin. Basically, managing the UTX sets is the most important thing that Bitcoin knows are doing. So, um, IDs in, in the Bitcoin world, it, it's true for blocks and transactions and almost everything, are hashes. So everyone knows what a hash is. So the ID of a block is the hash of a block. The ID of a transaction is the hash of the transaction. Um, Bitcoin uses uh, different kinds of hashes, SHA-256, 256 bits, right? MD-160, 160 bits, and combinations of SHA-256 and RIPE-MD and SHA-256. Uh, there's a catch, and I don't know the answer, and I think no one knows the answer. Uh, you have two concepts in Bitcoin, hash and ID. So the hash is just the hash you get from the hash function. The ID is the reverse of the hash. The bytes are reversed. And no one knows uh, 
when you use hashes and when you use IDs. And it gets more confusing because when people say ID, usually they mean hash. So if you look at, again, this, I'm not even sure that's what you would see if you look at, at the hash data in the memory of your node. I, I don't even know if the zeros would be at the beginning or at the end. It's a source of confusion, endless confusion, even among Bitcoin developers. <coughs> basically, hashes and IDs are the hash of that thing, except sometimes you reverse the byte order. <coughs> the script, so is it okay for UTXO? Does everyone get what UTXO means? Just one question on the um, the signature script that's, that was in your UTXO drawing. What what part of Bitcoin verifies the signature script is right? Is it the nodes that do that, or the miners just? Uh, it's, a, it's supposed to be everyone, but the nodes have to verify the script. I'm, I'm going to explain how the script works. Oh, okay. But yes, nodes are supposed to verify that blocks are valid, and it means that new transactions spend from the UTXO set and our scripts are valid. And so, I don't know if you've heard of SPV nodes, nodes that don't have all the data. Uh, it's very useful for mobile wallets, but one of the criticisms of SPV nodes is that they don't have all the data, and so they can't check everything. So that's why some core developers um, are against having, making things too easy for SPV developers, because they want people to run full nodes, because you need people to have all the data and validate against all the data. Otherwise, you would not be able to detect problems in, in the box. So, so UTXO, again, owning bitcoins means you have private keys that control UTXO. And if that UTXO is gone, your money is gone. And they change all the time. Every time a new block comes in, the UTXO set changes. So that is I think to me that's one of the keys to understand Bitcoin scripts. So Bitcoin is a very basic fourth-like language um, uh, to, uh, to verify that transactions are valid. Uh, so fourth is a very old language where you have a stack and operations on the stack. So if you want to add things, you just get the two items on the top of the stack, you add them together and push them back, push them back onto the stack. Uh, it's a very, very limited language, but it has good properties. It, it has no loops, for example, uh, by design. It has really interesting properties, and one of them is uh, that you can static, statically uh, check that scripts are valid. You can read scripts, it's a bit cryptic, but you can understand scripts and check that there are no errors. If you were to add loops or complex control into the script, it would become nearly impossible to statically validate what scripts are doing. You have you would have to run scripts. That's one of the problems on Ethereum. Uh, sometimes you can't know in advance how much gas you're going to spend, so sometimes you have to run your scripts. Uh, I don't know if they call them scripts in, in Ethereum, but basically you have to run them and you run out of gas, so you've wasted gas and still you don't get the result of your script. That is not possible in Bitcoin. You know in advance how much a script is going to cost in terms of computation. Like signature verification. <coughs> so the way the script work, again, um, you start with an empty stack, you run the sync script, so this, the script that you provide in your transaction input to prove that you can actually spend that input. You get a stack. You run the public key script of the inputs that you are trying to spend on that stack, and you get a final stack. And if everything is fine, you have one element on that final stack, and that element is the value one. If, it, if you don't get that single element with the value one, it means your script verification failed and your transaction is not valid. So that, that's how it works. Again, transaction. So this one spent this output. So first, I'm going to run this uh, six script get a stack. I'm going to run the public key scripts on the outputs I'm trying to spend. And if everything is fine, then I have a single one value on my stack. And so that's what you're supposed to do for every transactions that comes in in your block. So 
uh, this is a very um, uh, one of the most common scripts you find on the Bikram blockchain is basically public key hash. Uh, so the public key script is duplicate hash, push a public key, a public key hash, check that the value is the same, and then check the signature. And to spare that script, you have to provide a signature and a public key. So I think this one I'm going to show you exactly. Uh, Executive. Okay, so on the stack, again, this is your signature script. So that's the first thing you push to the stack. So you push your signature and the public key. So on the stack, you have this pub key and sig. Duplicate. So you duplicate the pub key. Hash, you hash the value that is at the top of your stack. So you hash this and replace the top of the stack with the hash of the public key. Equal verify. You check that what you hashed equals what um, is expected in the public key script. If it doesn't match, if it's not equal, then execution stops, otherwise it continues. Then all you have left is a pub key and a signature, and you check that the sig is valid for that pub key, and it is fine if you get one from the stack. So this, that's a basic big script. You can have much more complex scripts. I think I have an example here. Here, yeah, that's an actual transaction, big transaction, and you can see this is a signature uh, in uh, uh, their format, uh, 30 and the size, and 02 and the size, and that's a pub key. So, when you're used to how uh, signatures and pub key works in Bitcoin, you can spot signatures and pub keys in, in Bitcoin scripts. Multi sig transactions are a bit more complex. You have to, you can choose uh, X or Y. You, have, you, have, you, need, you want X valid signatures for Y pub keys. So the most common. Uh, but these instructions are two of two, which we use in lightning, so you want two signatures for two different puppies, and two of three or two of four. Like at async, we use a two of four scheme for our on-chain wallet. So there are four of us, we need two continuities to spend money from our own wallet. It's a bit more involved. You have two signatures, a script. Uh, all this is to show you that Bitcoin script is not limited to simple things. You can do a bit more. You can, see, you, can do, you can add delays. So it's not as powerful as what you find on other blockchains, but it's uh, safe as in there's a limited set of operations and it's very easy to check that it does what you want. So is everyone, is everyone okay with, especially UTXO and scripts? Okay, so now I'm gonna delve into lightning. Basically, Lightning is a protocol to create and update Bitcoin transactions that are publishable, but not published. <laughs> that's, that's the trick. Um, it's described sometimes as a layer two, like a, a layer on, on top of Bitcoin, um, or an off-chain uh, system, like everything is off the chain, everything is not published. It is based on the Bitcoin blockchain, as is as in Lightning is not about tokens or IOUs. Lightning uses actual, real Bitcoin transactions that have to be valid at all times. So it, it's really linked to the Bitcoin blockchain. Um, Lightning gives you different properties uh, compared to Bitcoin. Like you have cheap instant payments. It's very scalable. Like there are no limitations uh, when it comes to throughput. You could have millions of transactions per second on Lightning. It is still trustless, but the security properties of Lightning are different than what you get with Bitcoin. So, what it looks like is it's we try try to make it as as close to the UX you get with Bitcoin as possible. So, parent requests still uh, are usually displayed as QR codes, and you start QR codes, you pay, and uh, you pay on Lightning. Um, 
the term Line for Lightning, I think it starts back even before 2013. Like ideas about Pemachel have been around for a long time. Uh, but in 2015, Joseph Pinotage tried to like, collecting all the ideas, a bit like what Satoshi did with um, Bitcoin, and they published a white paper that basically explains how you could create a payment system where you could pay anyone uh, on the graph uh, with uh, very interesting properties like instant payments, cheap payments. Nothing much happens for a few months, and then Rusty Russell, who was not working for Blockstream at the time, published a series of blog posts about this is nice, this is what is missing to actually make it implementable, we should do it. And Rusty started the whole uh, actual deployment of Lightning. So he went to work on the first Lightning implementation, uh, C Lightning, or what was being called Lightning. Then he joined Blockstream, and Christian Decker went to work with him. And we started to work on Lightning at the end of 2015. In 2016, we had uh, the first spec meeting where we decided, and I think that's one of the most important properties of Lightning, we would have an RFC-like open spec. Um, this is unique, I think, among crypto projects, as in Lightning is not driven by a single company or a group of people. It's an open spec that uh, is anyone can contribute to it. It has like 50 contributors. It's completely open. Anyone can work on it, check it. And then you have implementations. And if you just read the spec, it's good enough so that you can implement Lightning just by reading the specs and nothing else. It's not easy work. It's going to take you a lot of time, but the spec is good enough, precise enough, so that you can implement Lightning yourself just from the specs. That's why, that's, uh, that was one of our goals from the beginning. And I think there are very, very few projects in crypto that have the same goal and the same results. And I think that's one of the reason why, reasons why Lightning took off, because you don't have to be worried about the business. It's an open source project, an open source IFC like spec. So if you don't like something that we do, or Blockstream, or Lightning Labs, you can just look at the specs, implement it, and you will be able to plug into the network, and you will be compatible with the Lightning Network. The first payment, the real payment, the first real payment was on, Light, uh, on uh, Litecoin because of the SegWit uh, mess in 2017. Like we were waiting for SegWit, uh, and we got tired of waiting, and we did the first payment on Litecoin because Litecoin got SegWit before. Me. And then it started on mainnet in 2018, so more than four years ago. Uh, as I said, it has an open source of specs um, that they are very, very uh, precise. It gives you a binary format for the messages you send over the Lightning Network. It tells you how you connect to other nodes. It, it specifies the format for big instructions. Are you supposed to route uh, payments through nodes? Are you supposed to discover the other nodes on the network? Uh, and uh, how you can Bolt, yeah, Bolt 12 is missing, but how you can create invoices for Lightning and how you can extend uh, Lightning with Fingerbits. Um, so all this is, is on, on GitHub, it's uh, there. And again, the spec and the implementations are very different and there are lots of people working on the specs that do not work for us or Blockstream or Lightning Labs. Uh, again, if you have any questions, just raise your hand. Um, the payment model in Lightning is what we call HTLC. Does anyone know what, what HTLC means? Hash time lock. Hash time lock contract, yes. Um, one of the other key things in Lightning is the concept of penalty transaction and invocation secrets. Basically, what you get with Lightning is a network of payment channels, like a graph, where you can pay anyone in a graph if you, if you can find a route to them. So, Lightning payment channels are uh, bidirectional, which means you can pay in both directions. There were some channel ideas in 2013 where you could only pay in one direction. 
there's one on-chain transaction to open a channel, one on-chain transaction to close a channel, and everything else happens off-chain. So you could make millions of payments on Lightning, and all you would see on the chain would be the first and the last transaction. multi of payments means that if uh, you can say, Alice pays Bob if and only if Bob pays Carol. What this means if is you can pay anyone, you can find a route. So that's, I think that's a game changer in Lightning compared to all the payment channels. This property. And there's a concept of penalty transaction. So I will explain what it means. But basically, since you can update transactions that are punishable but not published, you will end up with a bunch of transactions. You want to make sure that only the last one is safe to publish, not the other ones. So for this, we use a verification method where all, uh, all, all transactions are invalid because you give your counterparty a secret that let them spend everything in that transaction if you ever get to publish them. So the incentive for not cheating in lighting is if you cheat, the other node we steal all your funds, everything. So that's that's why you don't want to cheat. But it's a security property that is different from what you get with Bitcoin because it is it is active. Bitcoin, if you have a cold wallet, and unless your private keys are stolen, no one is going to steal your funds. Lightning, you need to be online, you need to monitor the blockchain, and you need to, to watch your channels, and you need to react if your channels are spent. So that's a, that is a constraint. That's very different from what you get with um, bigger nodes. So you can't really have cold lightning nodes. Lightning nodes are hot nodes. So it means that they're hot wallets, and you need to monitor the blockchain, and you need to be online. And the rec revocation of open transactions that we explain how it works, basically you give a secret that makes your whole transaction invalid or unsafe to publish. Someone yes. told me that Lightning wallets aren't exactly hot wallets, they're more like lukewarm wallets because they don't have to constantly be online just like every two weeks. What are your thoughts on that? Yes, so there are two types of Lightning nodes, uh, wallets, uh, all they do is send or receive funds, and routing nodes, which relay payments. Routing nodes, obviously, they have to be online all the time, otherwise you can't relay payments. But wallets, like your mobile apps, if you're not relaying payments, then it's safe to be offline, but you need to be online once every two weeks because two weeks is the window during which you can punish someone if they publish a node transaction, a revoked transaction. So Lightning is, for, for Lightning, if you're not relaying payment, it is safe to be offline, but you need to check on the blockchain every like two weeks to check if your channels are not being spent. So it's a constraint, it's not that bad, but that's one of the constraints with Lightning. Uh, there's an ID call, called Watchtowers that would let you delegate watching the blockchain to th third parties. It's very hard to implement in practice because either you tell them too much information and they know who you've been, who you've been paying and when, or you, do, you don't give them much information. Basically, it means they store data that they can't erase on their own disks, and this doesn't make sense from an economical point of view. Storage is the one thing that is really expensive in the cloud or anywhere else. You can get cheap VPSs, but you can't get cheap storage. If it grows, it's going to be more and more expensive. So watchtowers, in our opinion, are not widely deployed because they don't make sense from an economical point of view. Do we have any idea of how many times people have actually tried to cheat people with Lightning? It's very, very uncommon because you, you can spot the transactions on the blockchain. And what we think is like 99% of cheating attempts were actually people who messed up their backups and published old states. Um, again, because of that property, uh, Lightning backups are very, very hard to get right if you restore an old backup. And if you publish your current state, which has been revoked, you lose your friends. And we believe there are very, very few cheating attempts, maybe 
half a dozen over the last two years. Most of the peer interactions are yes. Of those few cheating attempts that have happened, like which was the most dangerous? Like, what's the scenario where you can actually see that uh, becoming very dangerous? Like for example, you have a you open a channel to someone. All the phones are on your side, so the first transaction gives you everything. You you use all of it. You pay for a lot of things, and basically you end up with the transaction by being channel with. And all the phones are, are on the other side, and you see that your pay is offline. It's been offline for like a month. You may you may think, okay, the guy's been offline for a long time. Maybe he's not coming back, and maybe it's safe to publish my my first transactions and get everything back. That's, I think, probably the incentive for trying to cheat. A couple of years ago, Bitmex, Bitmex um, published a post uh, analyzing justice transactions. You leave a fingerprint, and I think at the time there were like 40 total that had been that, that, uh, attempts to cheat that had been a <coughs> justice transaction. So, there's that. Um, but if you look up justice transactions at Bitmex, you find that article. So actually, it, the lacking backups and getting them right is so difficult that we pushed for a change in the specs, I think it was a few years ago, where basically, if you're connected to a node that is nice, and if you tell them, okay, this, this is the last secret that I remember, the last point that I remember, and if you're late, they will be nice and publish their own state so that you have a chance to get your friends back. They couldn't decide that, okay, you're lost and maybe you're, you're, you're an easy target, but they don't. Most nodes are nice and it, it's not uh, trustless, as in it's, it's, a, it's a matter of goodwill, but most nodes implement that protocol. So if, you're, if, you're, if you restore an old backup and connect to a node you're challenged with, they will know that you're late and they will help you get your friends back. You bark like nodes. I trust this node to not lie to me in that scenario, but not, not this other one. Or at that point, you're just desperate because you have a corrupted backup. Uh, yes, basically, you, you have to trust them to do the right thing because otherwise, you're not going to see your, 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 your money again. So, so this is what um, lightning looks like. So that first was actually so Alice is opening a channel to Bob. The first transaction is published on the blockchain. So that's the opening transaction. This is the one you want to watch. You want to, you need to have a way to look for that transaction on the blockchain and do something. It is if it is spent, and that is hard to do on all those forms. So the first thing is what we call commitment transaction. On Alice's side. She has 10 bitcoins and Bob has nothing. And on Bob's side, he has 10 bitcoins for Alice and nothing for him. And then, as they make payments, basically they, they change how funds are split within that channel, which is also one of the limitation, limitations of Lightning. So you come, there's a capacity that is your upper bound for Lightning payments. On that channel, you can't, make, you can't pay for more than 10 bitcoins. You have to work within the boundaries of the of the channel. So you can so when you make a payment, you update how the balance is split. You can do that a million times. No one will see that except for you and the those involved in the payments. But this is there is no public record of all these changes. And then when you're happy and you want to close the channel, you publish a closing transaction that basically takes the last state, in that case it's four beacons for minus six to Bob, and publishes and publishes uh, the, the transactions to the blockchain. And then your channel is closed. Uh, there are no limits uh, in terms of time or number of blocks to the, the number of payments you can make. Uh, channels can be live for years. We run one of the biggest and oldest nodes on on mainnet, I think we have channels that have been open three years ago, and, and I've made like fifty thousand payments. So you, you can keep keep your channels open for as long as you want. Um, a quick question for you. So again, that first transaction sends to a multi-sig Alice and Bob. 
books. Why is it a multi sig 2F2 Addison bomb? What, what is a really nice property you get from that setup? Cooperative close. Yes. Either and can unilaterally pick up their points. Yes. Okay. Um, since it's 2F2, to spend your funding transaction, you have to do something. It can't be spent without you without you signing a transaction that spent it. So if your keys are not stolen, you know that that share that can't be spent by anyone else. So that's one of the really nice properties of, of June to multi sig. Yes. One of the drawbacks is with a lightning as it is today, you can spot uh, lightning transactions on the blockchain. Basically, all the multi sig two of two you can, transactions you see on, on the blockchain are lightning channels. This will change with uh, template, but it's one of the limitations of, of lightning. Yes? On a force close, does that fall back to the HTLC, or does it still? Force closing means publishing your current state. So again, um, one of the tricks of lightning is at all times, you have a valid publishable Bitcoin transaction. So if something goes really wrong, or if your, the, the nodes you are connected to, they all go offline or something really bad happens, or you can publish your current state, your current transactions, and you get your money back. Again, that is very important. At, at all times, you have a valid, properly signed big transaction. So force close is just, you publish what you currently have. Uh, again, there's a, there's a race in the, the establishment of channels that can be used to uh, intrigue users. Uh, basically, when you open a channel, you send funds to a 2 of 2 multi sig that you can't spend. So you need a refund, you, you need to have a valid first commitment transaction uh, so that if something goes wrong or if your key disappears, you get your money back. So. Uh, I won't write it, uh, write it write this now, but if you write everything on a piece of paper, you see there's some kind of race condition and things have to happen in, in a given order. Otherwise, you end up being held hostage, as in you have to beg your counterparty to sign your current transaction. Otherwise, you have funds that are locked and you can't spend them. So there's a kind of a race. And reliability, uh, I think it was mentioned in one of the talks before, I think your talk. Uh, Reliability in Bitcoin means you can change the ID of a transaction. Um, it, it was true before SegWit. Uh, in Bitcoin, if your signature is valid, the signature is, is just two numbers. If uh, they're called R and S, if R and S are, is a valid signature, then R and minus S is also a valid signature. And since, if you remember, the ID of a transaction is the hash of the whole transaction in the legacy format before SegWit, the signature is included in the hash of the transaction. So if you replace the signature with another, another one that is valid, you change the hash. And that's the malleability issue we had. What it means is, Alice and Bob agree on a funding transaction, on a commitment transaction that spends the funding transaction, but Alice decides to change the ID of that funding transaction, and then you're stuck you have basically a refund that is not valid because the ETXO you're spending from is not going to be in a blockchain. So SegWit was, a, was something we really needed for Lightning uh, to prevent this type of attacks. And it's true for all protocols where you chain unpublished transactions. If the IDs can chain from under you, then you have a huge problem. So that's what a commit transaction looks like. Basically, this is uh, from Alice's point of view. Alice has a main output, Bob's main output, and for each payment that is pending, she has an HTLC that she offers, and the time of transaction, so that she can get her money back if the payment is not settled. And for each payment that she's received, she has what we call a success transaction, uh, that gives her the money uh, that adds the payments to her balance. Uh, these are not supposed to, these are transients. Like payments on Lightning are supposed to be either um, 
full field of fares. So this is just a, these are pending. They're waiting for payments to be full field of fares. But ideally, a good commitment transaction only has two outputs, yours and your peers. And in all these outputs, there's a, I don't know, I call it the circuit breaker, but maybe there's a better name. There's something that gives everything to Bob if he knows the secret. And that's the basis of Lightning security. You can't publish an old state because if you do, and if Bob knows that secret, he can spend all Alice's outputs with that secret. So Alice is not supposed to try to cheat because if she does, and if Bob detects that the channel is being spent with a normal transaction, she takes everything. Uh, sorry, sorry, Bob takes everything. So the, the, the payment model is very simple. Hash, time locked, contract. It means I will give you bitcoins if you give me the pre-image of a hash. So everyone knows what a pre-image is. Okay. So hash because you, you, you pay for the pre-image of a hash and time locked because if nothing happens, after a while you get your money back. So if you propose a payment and nothing happens, after a while, you get your fat back. So basically, a payment in Lightning is an amount, a payment hash, and a delay. So for example, if I want to buy something, like a cup of coffee, I will scan a, a Lightning invoice, and the invoice contains a payment hash, an amount, and the delay, if it's not included, there's a default, and I think the default is nine blocks. So that when you scan a QR code in Lightning, I don't know if you've tried Lightning before, but basically you get the payment hash, the amount, and the delay. So the way it works is you scan the QR code, in this case, uh, uh, it's an SGS equal to two bitcoins. We start with six bitcoins for Alice and four to Bob, and Alice wants to buy a, a picture of a cat for two bitcoins. So Bob says, send me an HCLC for two bitcoins. This is through a QR code, a, an email, a short message, it could be anything. Just the payment details, the hash, amount, and expiry. Uh, Alice will create a new commitment transaction for Bob, and she will move two bitcoins for her balance to a pending payment, an HTLC of two bitcoins to Bob. And she will sign that new transaction for Bob. Bob will send the revocation secret for his old transaction and in a new point that is used to derive keys for the transaction. They change all the time. So, once Bob has done this, he cannot use his old transaction safely. Bob can only publish this. The old one is, is not safe to use because Bob has given his uh, regression secrets to us. And Bob will sign Alice's new covenant transaction. And it does the same. He moves two bitcoins from Alice's um, output to a pending payment. Signs it. Yeah. Alice will do the same. She sends our revolution secrets to Bob. So she can't use the old transaction by gave her uh, six bitcoins. And a new point to encryption keys that change um, all the time. And now Bob sends back the pre-image for H. Alice check that this is indeed, when you hash R, you get H. And she moves, and that payment is not pending anymore, it's been fulfilled, so she, she moves the two bitcoins to Bob's output. And she signs, and again, the same revocation pens. Every, basically, every, every time you sign a new transaction and you send it, the node replies with the revocation secret for the previous transaction. 
and so on. And you've moved, basically, once you get there, you've moved two bitcoins from Alice's balance to Bob's, and you've paid two bitcoins. So it looks complex, a lot of interactions, but these interactions happen between two nodes that are connected to each other, so it, it takes just a few milliseconds. Sometimes, maybe, like, with a good connection, maybe, I don't know, 50 to 60, 50 to 60 milliseconds, so it's, it's pretty quick. Um, we spoke about this a bit. Again, when, whenever you have questions, just raise your hands. Uh, there are three ways to close channels, the good, the bad, and the ugly one. The good way is both nodes are online at the same time, and they negotiate a, a non-chain fee for the closing transaction, and they publish it. So you get your current balance published with fees that are supposed to be like, valid for the current blockchain. And that's the end of your channel. The bad way is the peer makes mistakes, sends you garbage, or maybe you can't connect to it anymore, it's gone. So you publish your, your current criminal selection. But there's a problem. <coughs> the first one is, and I'll get back to it later, you can't control the fees for that transaction. It's probably the biggest problem for us and for big node operators right now. We like it. The fees for that transaction could be really high and you're stuck. Either you don't publish it and your funds are locked, or you do publish it and you lose money because of high ocean fees. That's a big problem. The other problem is that because of that window during which you can penalize uh, cheating attempts, you can't use your funds straight away. You have to wait, typically two weeks. So force closing is not good because when you force close, you can't access your funds straight away and you can't control the fees you need to pay to pay one chain. And the ugly way is when your peer cheats, publishes an open transaction, <coughs> you have two weeks to punish them using the revolution secret they gave you. And you can take all the money. This is um, one of the key issues with lightning. Uh, the assumption is, for Lightning and other protocols, that if you have two transactions that spend the same outputs, and if one of them has a delay, the other one will be confirmed before it. If there's a race between two transactions and one is delayed, then the first one will win. This is true most of the time, maybe all of the time, but when there's a problem, like congestion on the blockchain, or you have uh, fees for your transaction that are really too low, it may not so, uh, a lot of papers have been published on Lightning about attacks on Lightning, uh, all linked to how you can pin transactions that pay really low fees and prevent them from being published. And if you can't publish transactions for like a long time, like two weeks, then you have a problem because the cheating transaction could win the race. So this is one of the assumptions, security assumptions of Lightning that is really not obvious at the beginning, but there are interactions between fees and congestion that make it more or less safe. Uh, two, two questions here. On the penalty transaction, so let's say in that case you were talking about I have all the funds were on my side and I publish it. I still have two weeks to publish the penalty transaction and get the full funds back if I'm the one that was uh, in, in the wrong. Is, is that correct? Yes. And then in a case where, let's say if I were an attacker and I wanted to try and steal as much money as possible from a big channel, would I would like the best attack basically be to wait until fees are sky high and then do this and then essentially you know, either discourage the person from acting at all or force them to pay extremely high fees to try and get their uh, yes. justice transaction? Yes, exactly. Um, uh, there's some kind of uh, race where if you want your transaction to confirm, uh, you can add more fees. But then adding more fees means losing money. So eventually you have to choose between either you just let go or you add enough fees so that it, it's not profitable anymore. So yes, it's one of the issues with, uh, with like But it's, it's going to get better. I'll get into it later. But so if you're an attacker and you want to reduce the amount of risk, you just 
spend all your, you know, put, basically push all your Bitcoin to the other side of the channel. Mm -hmm. And then you cheat, right, and try to reverse to an old state. Like what's, there's no risk. There is a little risk, yes, right? It's, it's something I didn't mention, but you can't push everything to the There's always a small amount yeah, that's held, right? Yeah, okay. what we call a reserve you have to keep. Otherwise, there would be no incentive not to cheat. But again, this plays with fees, because if the reserve is too small, it's like below um, the fees you would pay to pay that transaction. You may have like, incentive problems. One more question that maybe you're going to touch on. With the HDLCs, um, you have the, the two-week timeouts. I know there's a lot of concern around sort of DDoSing the network. Yeah, there, there are two different timeouts. The first one is the window you have to publish uh, peers that are trying to cheat. That is two weeks. Mm -hmm. The other timeout is the refund. You want to pay someone and they're not replying. And your, your HDLC is pending. Mm -hmm. So when it, when it expires, you can spend it you can you get your money back <coughs> with the time out transaction and the delay for that is um, it could be just a few blocks. Okay. So it, these are two different timelines. The revocation window or the penalty window and the expiry for payments. When you hear people concerned about the sort of the, the channel jamming or DDoS attacks where um, I guess they make it really different. Right. Is that something you're about to touch on? Or? Uh, yeah, so. Yes. Okay. So these are the actual scripts. If you're into scripts, uh, Bitcoin script, you can check the uh, the script we use in Lightning. They're not that complex. They use uh, Relative timeouts. This means I want enough confirmations on that transaction before it's expendable. And yeah, there's no CLT, CLT here. This is an HLC script. It's a bit more complex, but it means you send money to a remote puppy or to a timeout transaction or to a privilege. So now we've seen how payments work. Payments work for a single channel. Uh, now we're going to see how it, you can extend it to a network of, of channels. So suppose Alice wants to buy something from Cal, but she doesn't have a direct connection to Cal. She has to go from Bob. It's exactly the same idea. Alice will send an HTLC. I mean, again, Carol will choose the image. Uh, H is chosen by Carol, so Carol choosing H publishes, I don't know, a QR code, something that says, that says Alice, send me an HTLC for that many bitcoins and that payment hash. And Alice will find the route on the network, go through Bob, send Bob an HTLC for two bitcoins and, and a pre-image. Bob will relay the payments to, to Carol with the same uh, payment hash. Carol sends uh, the free mage back, so now she's been paid. And Bob now is paying on this side, so he wants to get money on this side, so we forward the free mage back to where it comes from, so back to Alice. And basically the way lightning works is Alice doesn't pay Carol. Alice pays Bob, and Bob pays Carol. That's how lightning works. Uh, so that's an old image. Uh, that's Lightning Network of Testnet uh, some time ago. It's, it's much bigger now. It's too big to, to, to make a, an image that is nice enough on, on a slide like this. Uh, again, if you have questions, just raise your hands. Uh, Lightning said, uh, uses onion routing. Onion routing is similar to what? the Tor network is using. It means you add layers of encryptions for your the nodes that we relay your messages and you start with the destination. So suppose you want to send a message to D through A, B, and C. The first step is you encrypt your message for D. Then you encrypt the message 
for C. So when when C gets it, it'll find like routing instructions of the next node is D and an encrypted packet that is supposed to send to D. Then you add an encryption layer to for, for B and again for A. So the way it's used is when A will receive that onion, it will peel the first layer with his own uh, encryption key and finds the instructions uh, what, it, what it's supposed to send to the next node. So basically, A removes his layer and sees, okay, you have to relay that payment to B, and again and again and again. This, this gives you really interesting properties. Um, nodes don't know where payments come from and where they go to. All they know is uh, where they got the payments from, like the last hop and the next hop. So it gives you really good privacy properties. Um, basically, that's what you get. When you relay payments, you know where it comes from, you know where it's going, just the next one. But you don't know who is actually sending the payment and who is the destination of your payment. So in many ways, Lightning gives you much better privacy than, than Bitcoin because First, payments are not public, they're not published to a public blockchain you can analyze. And routing, onion routing makes it really hard to know who is paying the So unless you're, obviously, if you are the last node and if you are the first node, suppose you're chain analysis, you're running like thousands of nodes in the network. Obviously, if, if you're the first node and the last node, then, then you can tell who is paying who because one of the limitations of Lightning today is the pre-image that we use. <laughs> it's the same all along the route. That's one of the big limitations in terms of privacy for Lightning. Uh, you can correlate pre-images, uh, payment hashes easily, and it tells you, it gives you a lot of information of, on who is paying who. Once we have Taproot and PTLT, this will change. We will replace hash and pre-image with public keys and signatures, and you can tweak public keys, so you won't be able to correlate payments as easily. But it's not the case today. So again, if I, if I am, if I'm the node there and there, I can tell who's paying who because I can just match on the payment hashes. This is not something that would be possible once we switch to PTLT. Uh, again, a very nice property of of Lightning when it comes to privacy is that it's a way to exchange bitcoins for somebody else's bitcoin without any links between those bitcoins on chain. Um, suppose you okay, I don't have a slide for that, but you I open a channel to you, and basically there's a path. Uh, through some of you to you and then back to me. I send all my money, I open channel to you, I send all my funds on a signal route back to me and I close both channels. What happens is if I add like two bitcoins, I've given you two bitcoins and you've given me two bitcoins. There is no links between you two. It's impossible to spot that these belong to the same user or whatever. You can really break links between bitcoins much easily. Much easily. Uh, it's, it's not something you can do on, on, with on chain. I don't know if you see what I mean, but you can use Lightning to exchange Bitcoin with someone else in ways that are not possible easily with CoinJoin or other, or other systems. Oh, so that's how CoinJoin kind of works in a way. Or yes, but yeah. No, because you can look. Oh, yeah. You have like a, a, a hotspot you can monitor and try to understand what's going on. With Lightning, it's just not possible. Mm. <coughs> Worst part of the Lightning spec, it's really a mess. It's what we call gossip. It's, a <laughs> it's bad. It's very, very bad. It's not a huge problem now, but it's bad. So basically, to compute boots, Yes. So, sorry, I'm, this is, I'm trying to understand a little bit back on the onion routing. Onion routing is 
it's a protocol, right? It's it's not it's a separate. It's not like a different network. It's just the way the messages are sent. Yes. Right? Okay. So it's not like yeah. like Tor is supported by volunteers using the Onion routing, but it's completely separate from no. something like that. Everything happens between lagging nodes. So okay. Basically, the you can use connections between lagging nodes to send payments. And to, to do more now, I don't know if you've heard of Bolt 12, but Bolt, Bolt 12 is based on Onion Messages. Onion Messages is just using the same, the same uh, Onion routing system to send more than payments, to send like messages like uh, create an invoice for me or do something for me. Mm -hmm. But you can, all, all Lightning nodes are connected to other nodes and it can exchange in a safe way messages with other notes. No, that question comes from the idea of what you were saying about the ability to route a payment through the network and back to yourself and basically turn KYC Bitcoin into non-KYC Bitcoin, essentially. Something like that, right? Yes. Um, so the thought of like zero fee routing, right? The, the ability to send it without fees, if there's a way to do that, and then, you know, I don't need to go into a lot of details, but the thought is, you know, like, the Tor network itself works without fees, and it's just kind of trying yeah, to play with this. I know it's not connected in any way. Is, just, with, um, with Lightning, you have interactions and setup constraints in right, the right. Tor, so well, for this to work, you need to have actual channels which are linked to transactions for this on the blockchain. You, you can't just, you can connect to a node, any node on, on, on Lightning, but to be useful to exchange payments, you need yeah, to yeah, have yeah, channels, channels, and that is expensive. So you, that's where the comparison with, with Tor, I think, starts because it's okay. limited. Well, the example of you doing your circular rebalance through us, you know, each one of us could be charging a fee on top of that yes. also. You can't just, rebalance within your own node. You need to get something out there for something to come back in. But I mean, if you had, like, if I, if I used your service and set up a bunch of nodes, right? I'd, yeah, multiple and, nodes is one. Right. Thing, but And then yeah. route to myself and basically set the fees at zero, open channels to my own Yeah. Node. And then, so just, then close them? Sure. Yeah. yeah. Hide all. <laughs> yeah. Interesting. Anyway. Yeah. Sorry. I didn't mean to get too far off. Uh, by the way, I don't know if, you have, if I'll have time to explain this, but rebalance within the network doesn't work. Yeah. I, I don't know it's where good. the ID comes from. It's, it's really puzzling to everyone in the Lightning community, developers community because we Self all know it doesn't make sense, right. but everyone is crazy about rebalancing and it's, I, I really would like to understand where the ID comes from. But it, if I have time, I'll, I'll do a few things. But it, I have some theories on that. It doesn't make sense at all. It's really I agree. mind boggling. I, I think it's an OCD thing. People just... Human so this is again the worst part. Basically, we have a, like a, we publish, we, we broadcast information on nodes and channels on the network, which means we we recreate some of the problems you have with the blockchain. And you have to publish everything to everyone. This is really bad. Um, it, there are pre previous issues because you <coughs> give out information on transaction IDs that you can use to link nodes and Bitcoin addresses. So this is something we want to change. Uh, it, it's bad for many reasons, but in practice, for uh, if you're connected to the network all the time, it's not a problem because you, you're not missing data. It's a problem for mobile nodes, and on mobile nodes, anyway, it cannot work. So it's a mess, but the mess is more from a privacy point of view. From an efficiency point of view, it doesn't work on mobile phones, and there are, there are no issues on big routing nodes. But if you're into graph theory and if you want to do something on Bitcoin, one one thing that really could use some love and does not involve that, to really know a lot of things about things and everything, is the graph thing, the, the gossip. It's it's broken. It's bad. <laughs> so lightning in a, in a nutshell is. When you create a channel, you publish a financial transaction that sends money to a multi-sig, and you both keep a, a transaction, a valid, <laughs> publishable transaction at all times, 
that spans the federation that is signed by both parties and that gives you your money back. And then you exchange messages to update how the balance is spent. If someone cheats, there's a window during which you can take everything, but you have to be active or you have someone to do it for you. So it's a passive, like a cold wallet. And you can close the channel anytime you want and publish a final closing transaction. Uh, this, I think I've shown you how it works. So, what we've learned is that Bitcoin is really nice and it solves a problem that people thought it was impossible to solve in any meaningful, practical way. And I think that. Is it Greg Maxwell? Someone, someone famous, uh, called the Lippers, wrote that he thought it was a scam because he didn't think that what Satoshi is and Akamoto did with Bitcoin, Bitcoin, was, Bitcoin white paper was actually possible. But there are limitations, and it's true for all public blockchains. And the limitations are, first, there's a throughput that is very limited on public blockchains. For Bitcoin, do you know how many transactions per second you can get? on the Bitcoin network. So, yes, so it's nothing. It's really nothing. The other problem is delays. Uh, again, if you work out how you can propagate information on a peer-to-peer -peer network, you see that you have to wait. The less you wait, the more problems you have, like uh, orphan blocks, and orphan blocks means people lose money, miners lose money. So you have delays and you have fees. If blockchain space is limited, there will be a, like an auction kind of system to get into the, the next box and you have fees and that is a problem. Lightning is based on Bitcoin, it's really based on Bitcoin. So again, Lightning is based on actual valid Bitcoin transactions that you can publish. It gives you trustless instant payments with unlimited throughput, but there are uh, trade-offs. And the biggest one is you need to be online to send and receive payments. You can't have like, actual core wallets. And you need to monitor the blockchain. And that's also a huge concern. And now, uh, uh, if we have a bit more time, uh, this other thing is basically, basically what I just said. OK. Uh, I'm going to talk about what the pain points are and how they can be improved. So, um, first, I don't know if some of you want to get into Bitcoin and Lightning Development, but it's, it's, it's really exciting. It's um, one of the sexiest applied cryptographic projects you can think of. Uh, it mixes very different hard domains. And more and more, we try to switch from the technical problems to the economical problems that come with uh, Lightning and Bitcoin. So how do you make a profit? Where is uh, the value spent? What are the risks? What are, what are the security issues? Um, I think having a payment system like Lightning, which enables anyone to receive payments from anyone else without license, without regulation with instant payment and micro payment is a pretty interesting thing. What is a bit disappointing is I wrote this a few years ago and at the time there was um, Satoshi's place and the thing where you feed chicken. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> Poyo feed. Yeah, Poyo feed is amazing. <laughs> but there haven't been really new exciting developments. And one of the things that I find a bit disappointing is a lot of people want to use lightning for really complex stuff. Then it seems no one wants to use Lightning and Bitcoin to just pay for things. And to me, this is where adoption will come from. Someone like Lightning Koala a few years ago will come up with an ID that is really nice and simple to implement with Lightning. That would be really, really hard to do with Visa. And such as this place is impossible to do with Visa. And this is where adoption will come from. Maybe it will be, it will be through video games or I don't know. But I think this is what people should focus on. We have a payment system, why don't we use it to, 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 to buy and sell things instead of trying to uh, find things that are more and more complex. So, uh, I don't believe a lot in DeFi. So. <laughs> uh, uh, 
us, okay, this is outdated. I'd like to come back to the biggest issue that I think we have with Latin today. Okay. This. Big Latin selections are publishable big transactions. What does it mean? What does it take for a big transaction to be publishable? Why do you have to check two signatures? Yes, it has to be signed properly. And what you're spending that amount. Yeah, the inputs must still be available on the blockchain. Mm -hmm. It takes those. Yes. Yeah. You, you have to spend things that are still in the ETX set, otherwise that's much less not valid. And there's a third thing that is more operational than, than just a sort of cryptogra cryptographic thing. It's, a, it's like a, an operational thing. You need a property for your transaction for it to be published on, on the Bitcoin network. It has to pay fees that are realistic. Uh, funnily enough, it was really hard to check that the transaction was publishable with Bitcoin Core until a few, I think a few months ago. There's a new RPC call, it's um, test mempool accept. Basically, you can check that your transaction can be accepted by your own mempool. But before that, it was really hard to check that the transaction was valid. And this, and especially the fact that you need to pay realistic on-chain fees is probably the biggest issue that node operators like us face would like. So again, suppose uh, suppose you're there, you're somewhere there, you have like, made a bunch of payments and your peer goes away. What you have with Lightning as it is designed today is a transaction that you can't change. You have funds that are locked on your side, you have on-chain fees you cannot control, and you have two choices, you wait. But the more you wait, the more that the money that is locked is not used for something like meaningful for you. Or you publish the transaction, and you pay fees that were set maybe years ago. I said well, that we still have channels that were open two or three years ago. If the peer goes away for some time, we may have fee rates that were set two years ago when the fee rate was 50 cents per byte or 100 cents per byte. That's a huge problem because what it means is suppose you have thousands of those channels that nobody is using anymore because the peers have, have gone away, they're not online, they have problems, whatever. What you have is transactions with fee rates you can't control. And that's a huge problem because if the fee rates is really high, you, all the profit you make from routing payments on these channels is gone. So it may not sound like a big deal, but for us, it's probably the biggest operational issue today with Lightning, the fees. And the most exciting thing we, we're waiting for from Bitcoin is something called package relay. I don't know if you've heard of it. Okay, so some people have, uh, have had it. Basically, one of the, uh, can I draw this? Okay. <coughs> yeah, Fee, uh, fees is already a big issue, and there are mechanisms in Bitcoin to raise fees for transactions that are, that are stuck in the mempool. So you have two options. Replace by fee, which means you can replace a transaction with another transaction that pays more fees. And CPFP, child pays for parents, which means if a transaction is in the mempool, you can add a transaction, a transaction that spends it, 
and the Bitcoin node will think of them as one big transaction. Again, a Bitcoin transaction is a list of inputs and a list of outputs. So if you look at a bunch of transactions, you can just say, okay, it's what you can treat it as a big transaction with a huge list of inputs and a huge list of outputs. So it, it, from a functional point of view, uh, it, it's, it's, it's equivalent to one single transaction. But when you, what, what you cannot do today with Bitcoin is relay something that is below uh, the... Um, okay, I'm sorry. Like a minimum? Yes. The I, uh, I don't remember the name of it, but basically the, min the minimum fee you need to pay for your transactions to be relayed. Otherwise, it will stay in your mempool. It, it won't be accept accepted by other nodes uh, that are connected to you. Which means that if that first transaction is going to be relayed, you have a problem because you, you can't publish the child transaction that will bump its fees. That's a huge problem for Lightning. It means we can't set fees to the minimum because there are cases where, where we won't be able to bump fees up. What Package Relay is doing is basically it's fitting this as a single package that is relayable uh, atomically. So it, it's a way to relay transactions that spend other transactions in mempool in a huge package, even if some of these transactions don't pay enough fee to be relayed on the road. And for us, it's a game changer because what it means is we can set fees to zero on the commitment transactions, zero, no fees, and add fees as needed when we need to publish them. What it means is, if I go back to the example I gave you of channels we have with nodes that are not online anymore and for which currently we need to pay some some very expensive auction fees. Like a few weeks ago, we closed three thousand channels that we had lingering for some time. The peers were had been offline for six months. There was nothing we could do about it. We had to, to publish what we had at the time with the fee rates that were set when the channels channels were last used, and it cost us something like half a bitcoin or something. It was really expensive. Even though the fees were really low at the time, that's very frustrating. Once you have package relay, <coughs> you can set fees to your lightning transactions to zero, really zero, and when you need to publish them, you bring your own fees. And it changes the incentives a lot, and it changes how you uh, make users pay for the first channels they create when they use your system. For example, we make um, Phoenix, uh, an unconditional lightning wallet, and one of the hard UX problems with Phoenix is if you send money to someone and if they don't have active channels, you need to create one on the fly, which means that you need to pay on-chain fees for the opening transactions, but also you need to save some money for the closing transaction. And if the fees are really high, you need to save a lot of money, like thousands of thousands of issues. What it means is, if you're sending some money to someone, the costs won't be the same if they ha already have channels, if they're already connected to the network, or if they're not. From a UX point of view, it's a nightmare, because the sender cannot know and doesn't want to know if the people they're trying to contact already has uh, channels or not. It's like roaming a long time ago, when you would call people on the road, and you would say, ah, hang up, because it's costing me a fortune. It's, it's the same UX problem, and it's bad, it's really bad. And I know we take a lot of flack because Phoenix fees are, are seem expensive, but it's because we pay on-chain fees for all our channels, and we need to reserve enough uh, to pay for the closing fees, and we can't control it. Once we have this, we can set fees to zero, we can wait, we can optimize, like, for example, every Sunday there's a window where fees are really low. This is where we would publish transactions. But today it's not possible. So, so package relay and, and fee optimization is a huge thing for node operators, and it's not too good today. And it's also related to the, the attacks that you were talking about, the ping attacks, or if you have nothing at stake, 
uh, you can choose to play the game of bump fees with a competing transaction. And basically, the other node has two options. They, they, they play on and they also try to bump fees adding competing transactions, but eventually it becomes very expensive or they just give up. And again, from a practical point of view, fee management is probably the biggest operational issue we have on Lightning for the last four years. And this is where a lot of improvements from our point of view will come when we get package reader and other things and anchor outputs. Um, other big improvements that are not related to, to um, the economics of Lightning will be from taproots. Once we have taproot, we can have PTLC. The, the pre-image won't be the same along the route, so it will be much, much harder to analyze where payments come from. But this will take a long time. This is something we probably we will get probably uh, within the next six months. And another thing that is really cool and that, that uh, Lisa is working on is dual funding. So today, uh, suppose. So I know that some of you will disagree with that, but the model that is probably going to be used by a lot of people is the, the LSP model. Basically, mobile wallets will not connect to any node on the network. They will connect to somebody's lightning service provider and they will trust that provider, not from a cryptographic point of view, but they will trust the provider to do the right thing, to be online all the time, to be reliable, to not try to cheat when you wake up and you, you're late. Um, this is also needed when you want it's, oh, sorry, you can't see it very well. But this would be needed when you need instant channels, channels on the fly. You don't want to wait for the channel, uh, the funding transactions to be confirmed. You want ch new channels to be used straight away. This, this requires a bit of trust. Not trust, again, from a cryptographic point of view. Trust as in that thing has to work properly. So that's why we believe that what, we, what we're doing, uh, what Async is doing, or Breeze, or others, is how most likely what it would, what it would work. They won't let you connect to just anyone. They will let you connect to their own node because that's how you get a reliable UX from Lightning. If you connect to a node that is offline very often, it means you can't pay, you can't receive payments. There's a lot of problems you, you can get into. And uh, that node we pay on-chain fees. That node will create transactions for, for you, uh, to transactions for you. We pay on-chain fees, and we'll be able to optimize when to publish on-chain once we have package relay. What it means is it would be cheaper to open the first node. And what Lisa is working on is um, splices, splicing, splice out. One of the issues with Lightning today, again, I'm talking from the point of view of non consumer wallets, is you have to have at least one channel per user, and in most cases, it's gonna be several channels. And it's a problem. Right. This is one user. You send yourself, I think it, it works with us and with Breeze and others. You send yourself like $20 to give it a try. And you have, you, have, you don't have a channel. Breeze or, or Async or others will create a, a, a channel for you with $20 on your side, and with a bit of funds on the other side so that you can receive money. So they will provide you with liquidity, and you, you will have to pay for it. You have to pay a small fee. So but now you're happy, okay, $20 is fine. You're gonna, you send yourself $50, and guess what? You get a new channel because you don't have enough incoming capacity. So you pay, or whoever is sending you the money, we pay on-chain fees again, and you're happy, and you try with $100, and you get a third channel. It's a nightmare. You pay on-chain fees three times, you have three channels. From our point of view, it's three lightning channels we have to manage, and it's a, it costs, it's a cost from a resource point of view. So what Visa is doing is a way to merge, to basically to change the funding transaction of a channel, to replace it 
with, it, with the transaction pairs more or less, more splicing, less supply size. This would be really cool because all chain fees would be less expensive. You would send one set of on chain fees. And from a management point of view, we want to have users with, we have users with, I think the record is more than 100 channels because they kept sending money with higher amounts. We can reduce this to one. It will be less expensive to us. And it's very important because, um, in our opinion, one of the keys for lacking development is it has to be realistic for non custodial wallets to compete with custodial wallets. And it's nearly possible today. So, this is us or Breeze. We have, I don't know how many channels, like dozens of thousands of channels to our users, or because what you, when you run Breeze or Phoenix on your phone, you run an actual mobile node that is connected to us. With Wallet of Satoshi, it's completely di different. It's an API, they control everything, and you tell them pay or receive money. But this uh, Wallet of Satoshi could work with only one big channel to the rest of the network. They don't have the same. One, users basically for them are free. They don't need to reserve funds to pay on-chain fee for every users. They don't need to manage one channel for every users. They can implement use cases like you send someone who has never used Lightning before one solution, and it's, there's, there's no bootstrapping issue, no onboarding issue. And one of our goals is to make sure that Lightning, I don't think it will ever be able to compete uh, to be as cheap as social wallets, but want to make it as cheap as possible. This is why we're pushing for some of the, some, some things like changes in the fee structure because we don't want to to um, to swallow the ancient cost. Not because we're greedy, but because we don't want people to think that things would be free when they would not be. It won't be sustainable. We also want to provide a UX that is as close to what whatever strategy is doing as possible. And it's very, very hard. And to us, that is probably the biggest challenge for Lightning. It's not really technical. Is how do you make a UX that is simple and competitive enough from an economical point of view, from a fee point of view, against whatever strategy or, or do what it was is custodial. I think they're switching to not custodial, but. It's not really technical, but it's very important for us that Lightning can compete from an economical point of view. And yes, we are expensive now because of that, because we don't want to, the cost we make users pay are the cost that we incur when, we, when things go wrong, and we don't want to just hide these from the public. <coughs> Did you say, you said that the biggest problem is you're, you're trying to compete uh, in UX against uh, on-chain wallets or, or no, self-custody? The custodial wallets. Custodial wallets. Uh, um, things like tipping, for example. Things that you can't do easily now with the payment system. Competing now directly with, the payment, with existing payment system is not going to work. Right. Not in Europe, not in the US. Maybe in Africa or South America, but certainly not in, in Western countries. Um, uh, the rebalancing conversation we started earlier. Oh yes, I I am really interested in that because I I'm food not... for thought because I think now it's 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 fine but it's an exercise for for all of you. Rebalancing. So. This is you. This is one of your channels. And all the money is on that side. And this, and you think this is an expensive channel because it uh, this is a very useful channel because it, it makes you money. So this, it's used a lot in this direction. And so there's an ID that is extremely common among Lightning users is that you have to rebalance. Rebalance from within the network, which means you have to somehow find a way to do this and move 
the equity back to this side because this is how you make money. This doesn't make sense for many different reasons. So I, I, I'd like you th to think about why it doesn't make sense. That, and that, that two really obvious reasons. The first one is, is directly linked to uh, root, root finding. What does it mean? Suppose that edge cannot be used to build a payment because all the funds are on the wrong, are, are on the wrong side. But you, you are able to rebalance from within the network that edge. What does it mean from a routing point of view? So I, I, I'll let you think about it. You, you route it back to yourself. In the network. Yes. So what does it mean that from the point of view of the same path this guy, made. this guy trying to pay this guy? Still That's the first, the first issue is if you can rebalance from within the network, what does it mean from a pathfinding point of view? Oh, uh, it's a circular, it's a cyclical. Yeah, but it, it means something. The other thing is, people say, okay, because what, 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 what we think is, if this happens, you have a challenge to have uh, some kind of big merchants on Lightning, and it's depleted very quickly. What you do is you just close it, and you open a new one. And that's what we do. We, we, we run the biggest node, we've been running the biggest node on Lightning for four years. We don't do rebalancing. Uh, we just watch where the payments flow, and when we see the channel is used a lot, and it's, it's about to be depleted, we just open a new one. And that's just all there is to it. <coughs> and that's what, uh, that's the root of the problem, because everyone that I know that works in Lightning Development or Bitcoin Development knows that you can't rebalance the network from within. You have to go out, which means you have to use swaps, or you have to close and open new channels. It's obvious for everyone within, and it seems to be absolutely not obvious for, for everyone that is not really involved in lightning development. And I think that's where the confusion, confusion comes from. Because otherwise, it's a zero-sum game. That's one of the other reasons. You're trying to rebalance. The other guys will try to rebalance, and it's not going to work. Um, it's a common issue when people try to set up bots. Like, there are, there are bots today that will change your fees to make rebalancing happen automatically. And you can see, you can read people telling you how they bought the bots and what the algorithms they use. And they make the same mistake you see in this type of, of setup. They all look at historical data and they apply their bots and their algorithms to the historical data. But what nobody does, because it doesn't work, because it shows it doesn't work, is assume that everyone is using the same algorithm on the same data. And what you, what you find out when you do that is you find out that you don't get anything. It works because you're the only one using the bots. When everyone is running the same bot, it's, the same happened with um, high frequency trading a few years ago. A lot of papers were published with like, amazing results because they were clever. They knew it was wrong. They used historical data. They said, okay, if we apply our algorithms to that historical data, we can make a profit. What they didn't tell you is if everyone is using the same algorithm, then nobody makes a profit because you're all fighting each other. So. When you're rebalancing, and if the other guys are also rebalancing, it's a zero-sum game. You're all fighting each other. And the, the last point I want you to think about is how you make profit, how you make a profit on your lightning node. People say it's too expensive to close the channel and open a new one. So I want you to think really hard about what it means if it's too expensive to rebalance on-chain. And what it means? And I, it's, it's an interesting, interesting exercise to, to, to reason, out, reason about fees and what it means. But basically, what you'll find is it means you can't make a profit on that edge. So I, yeah, just think about it. But if you cannot rebalance online, it means you will never going to make a profit on that edge. So just think about this. And I, I, I'll, I'll be around, I can answer questions. But really, think about first what it means from a pathfinding point of view to be able to rebalance that edge. And then think about what it means to say it's too expensive to go on chain. From a like, profit point of view, that edge is supposed to, 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 to uh, it won't make you rich, but you're supposed to, you won't, you're not supposed to lose money with that edge. So 
what does it mean exactly? And you see that rebalancing just is, is complete nonsense. High level, um, what does a relay node need to do to get inbound from a node like async? Uh, the, the, you just need to ask. We get, like, we receive emails, like, I don't know, almost every day from people telling us, okay, uh, can you please open a channel to us? Okay. And most of the time we do it. Cool. Uh, if, you use, if you use Phoenix, it's done automatically for you. So we will provide inbound liquidity for you whenever you receive the, the first channel is created. And we had a system, and uh, uh, I'm not sure if it's still running, but basically, um, when you create a channel, first transaction, there's a mechanism called push MSAT, which means you, the first transaction gives some funds to the other side of the channel. So it's like you're giving away free money when you create a channel. If you do that with us, or if you did that with us until some time, we would check the amount you were sending us and open the channel to you with funds on our side. It was a way of buying liquidity. Uh, Lisa, again, is working on something called liquidity ads, which is really nice and which really a way to allow people to advertise and buy liquidity uh, in Lightning, but using the Lightning protocol. There are sites where you can do that today, but it's or it's not part of Lightning, it's all proprietary systems. With Lisa's proposal, it can be part of Lightning. Thank you. Okay? There's another awesome. question. Um, I, 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 I really like your, your, your thought about how, how Lightning should approach gaining market share versus Visa and, and MasterCard. And I think just that everyone in Bitcoin agrees that you know, more decentralization and, and, and less um, and, and more self custody is, is better. But I, I do worry that that the consumer doesn't care. That that the consumer wants yes. this, this preferential experience and I, I think you acknowledge that, but also that, that it's always going to be easier uh, to do to do self uh, 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 non custodial I mean, to do custodial uh, yes. uh, transactions. So uh, um, and, and another thing is, is does it really end up mattering because for day-to-day -day payments, consumers don't seem to care about, like for instance, Venmo, transactions are public. People don't really care about, about if things are known or not. But but maybe you know, on-chain uh, on transactions can be done at scale, and if, if you know, for instance, in a war zone or in Ukraine or Russia or something like that, the large transaction can be done on-chain reliably, but the day-to-day -day transactions, you know, does it really matter if it ends up being uh, uh, custodial or not? I'm not sure the I know the answer to the question. Maybe not, and that's, uh, that's what is happening today. A lot of a lot of transactions on Bitcoin are, are off-chain transactions. When you're selling, some, if you have an account on Coinbase or on Kraken, and if you're selling funds to someone on Coinbase or Kraken, it's an off-chain transaction. It's not really, it's not trustless, but it is off-chain. Right. And yes, uh, I think uh, adoption will come, maybe not through mostly casual services, but a lot of them, because they're cheap, they work. A lot of people are worried that they won't be able to manage their private keys properly. That's a huge issue, probably one of the, one of the biggest issues. Um, I worked in a defense industry a long time ago and we had like encryption systems and private keys and people kept losing their keys or their keys were getting revoked and they had to use new one. It was a mess and it was between people who were supposed to know what they were doing and to pay attention to these kind of things. And it didn't work. So for a lot of people, the idea that if you lose your private keys, you've lost your phones forever is really hard to accept. So yes, there will always, always, always be services, social services um, for users, but we still need to make non casual services a realistic option. Yeah. I agree. Thank you. So do you, I mean, what do you think the capacity is of the Lightning Network right now? I mean, can we onboard an entire country, like a, America, it's not even a country, United States? It's going to be difficult. Uh, we got El Salvador. <laughs> yeah, El Salvador's struggling with it, right? 
uh, they're struggling for, I think, I mean, a lot of reasons. But all of those are still reasons that yes. any country would struggle with. Uh, right? One of the elephants in the room is for lightning or anything like lightning to work, you need to have a window when you can publish things on share uh, cheaper. It doesn't matter if fees are high most of the time, as, as long as they're not high all the time. As if you can find windows when you can optimize and publish transactions that are not too expensive, it's fine. But if you, if you end up with on-chain fees that are really, really high all the time, then you have a problem. But it's true for not just for like for anything that is off-chain. I, I didn't go into the details, but <coughs> yeah, in, in, in Bitcoin you have um, the concept of dust. Like you can't create outputs of, of really low amounts. I think the dust limit is uh, around 500 satoshis. You can't create an output below 500 satoshis because it would be, to spend it, you would need auction fees that would be more than 500 satoshis. But if there's, there's the relaying fees, it's I think one such is per, per device today. And if fees go really, really high, these relay fees are going to go higher too. And you end up with transactions that you can't even relay. You need to find a way to connect directly to miners and send them a transaction. I, I think it really exists. Like there are API where you can send transactions to miners directly. I think there are APIs where you pay for them to. Like, like you pay a fee outside of the network, like a direct fee to a miner. Yes, I think I, I think it exists. Uh, but if fees are really high all the time, we have a problem. A lot of things are not going to work. So adoption right now. Adoption means everyone has UTX servers. I don't think we can have one billion ETX servers and billions of transactions every day with the network as it is today. So yes, to onboard that very quickly one billion people, you need something that is more yeah. uh, Unless they go make all their own nodes in one, one day. But it doesn't mean you need bigger blocks. Right. It means, not all the time anyway, it means that some, you need to get that window where, cheap, where fees become cheaper. Once you see it. Like, uh, is there any proposals? To, uh, maybe like every, every, yeah, you know, every uh, two weeks there's like a window for I think there was one, months. like every once in a while or when the mental becomes too big, you, you can have one big block and then you head back to so some blocks. For lightning? For, 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 for Bitcoin. I think that there were other ideas I don't remember what it's called. Um, extension box, maybe. But nothing really. I, I don't think anything is being implemented. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.